Well, hello and welcome back. Today we're taking a look at this Super Scope uh, professional portable recorder player thing. I'm not really sure. Uh, so I should probably say why I got this. So the reason I got this is because I wanted something that's battery powered, that's like portable, that has a line out signal. And that's exactly what this has. So this, I can put a tape in here and get line out. So then I can use this as like an input for something else. And it's got quite a few problems as we saw there. So it's got a broken switch. The view meter doesn't work. Uh, all of these uh, piano keys seem to be moving just fine. So no serious problems there. And here we can see, yeah, it's got tons of inputs and, and whatnot, but that line out, that's what I'm here for. So this leather pleather case, I, I really don't like the cover for it. Um, I, I, I probably won't ever use it. Uh, it's pretty tattered, but I also like the look of it without it. I like that brown plastic. And we can see that was covering up some breaks in it. So that corner is just gone, but that's not a huge deal. Again, this is, this is mostly like a tool for me. And so, yep, it's battery powered. So we got four D cells we can put in there to power this thing uh, that way. Or we can use a barrel jack for six volts. We can put in an AC line. Now I actually don't have any batteries. I don't have a six volt barrel jack, but I do have this random AC cord that does fit. It doesn't fit perfectly, but it seems to connect and yeah, it seems to give it power. You can hear the motor spinning, but like not much else is happening. And it doesn't sound great either when you're doing it. So I put a tape in, see if something would happen, and yeah, no, nothing happening. It's definitely just old belts. Uh, that's almost always the case with these things. So taking these screws out of the bottom, and this is the whole thing holding it together, these super long screws. I wasn't expecting this at all. So the way this is put together, it's like these two plastic clamshells are just sandwiched um, together. So those long screws, it just screws into the top of the plastic, essentially. And that's how it's held together. So there's, I, I thought maybe it would, um, I, I assumed it would have just been screwed into some kind of main chassis of the device. But yeah, it's just, there's just holes through it that those screws go through. And that little, uh, I guess it would be some kind of EM shield. And yeah, that wire tripped me up. So just gonna desolder that, get that out of the way. So now that those screws are removed from the bottom, we can just pull this up from the top and you can see that speaker has had some problems with it. And it seems whoever had this apart last just blasted right through that wire with one of the screws. Now, I think that still technically would have been a connection but that's, uh, yeah, that's pretty funny. It, it's no surprise that that happened. This thing has so many wires in it, just going everywhere. I, I've never seen anything with just this many wires in it. it it's, uh, it's actually kind of a, a hassle to deal with, and you can see it's weird mechanism there. So I'm just gonna cut the, the speaker out, and I'll just I'll resolder on new wires eventually. And then I need to get that mechanism out, and to do so I need to take this front panel off. So I had to take all the knobs out, push all the buttons out at the same time, and then I can pull it out. So with that front panel out of the way, I just can remove a handful of screws from around the perimeter of this mechanism, and then hopefully I can get it out. And once those are out, and it's kind of stuck on some stuff, but so I got that unstuck, I'll just flip it over to the left. You know, I'm trying not to pull on those wires too much, but it's it's kind of hard to tell. And yeah, there's the, that'd be a culprit. So the belts are just goo now. So that, uh, that those two drive belts are just gone now. I mean, the, you can see on the top side, the uh, tape counter belts are fine, but, and not these for whatever reason. So I'm just gonna disassemble as much of this as I can. Uh, especially just get any of the parts that still have that uh, belt goo on them so I can clean them better. So there's just little scraps of half 
dissolved belts all over the inside of this thing. It's it's really is quite a mess. But what, once I get that panel out of there, I can just pull these flywheels off, and we can see why it's called a dual flywheel system. Uh, I think it said that on the on the case itself. It's got these two big flywheels, which is pretty nice. So that one just pulls right out, but this other one is held down uh, by this metal tab sticking over. So I got to get that out of the way, and then I can pull the flywheel out. So it's just a simple e-clip. So pull that out. And once that's out of the way, I can pull the main flywheel up as well. And I really do need to remove these to clean them. You can see the the belt just you know jammed in on the, the V grooves of them. And then this little idler uh, pulley thing, I gotta get this out of the way and clean it as well. So these are the main contenders. So someone had recommended to me that I use Windex to clean like dissolved belts. So this is the first time I was I was trying to do that, and it actually works super well. It really does dissolve them. Um, in, in some regards, it's bad because it it you know it turns it into a liquid, and then it just gets even more places. But after a bit of work, it did clean it up. I don't know if it's the ammonia in the Windex that that gets it, but yeah, it did clean pretty well. It's especially nice for getting it off your your fingers. So put those flywheels back. I did put uh, oil on them, not this time though, but, and then on this piece of plastic, I noticed that it was, it was broken. So I just pulled it off the rest of the way. And then I was just going to glue it back together. So I'm using just some of this Loctite glue and just positioning it. And after letting it sit for quite a while, I'm just using the soldering iron to kind of melt together uh, the plastic on the seam. Now, I don't know if this actually does that much in terms of strength. Um, more so than anything, it's just it's just fun to melt plastic, which I think is the main reason I do this. So I did it around the entire crack in it. It, it seems to be pretty stout. Uh, so it should be fine as long as there's not some kind of really strong spring that's required to push on that uh, on that piece of plastic. So as long as that doesn't happen, we're in the clear. So I just, I, I didn't get a belt kit for this. I just had some random belts. So I was just testing them and these seem to fit pretty well on them. And I believe this is how the belts go. I hadn't looked in the uh, service manual yet. I was just kind of winging it. So, so I got the six volt plug next to my power supply. And so that's how I'm powering it. So I don't have it plugged into the uh, AC line. And the tension on this belt seems pretty fine as well, and everything seems to be spinning just fine. So I'm gonna start buttoning this up. So I'm putting some grease uh, where those fly wheels uh, mesh with this panel, and then I'll do so on this main one as well. I don't know if this is supposed to be oil or grease in those. Uh, it doesn't, I don't think it really matters. So I'll get that all uh, screwed down. And now this is the record button. And so there was a piece of plastic that fell out when I was taking this apart and I was hoping I would be able to figure out what it was to and it's definitely to this. So this record button thing interfaces with a switch on the circuit board below. So when you hit the record on the actual mechanism, it's able to tell the device to go into record mode. So that broke off. So I got to disassemble this and try to re-glue it together. So. It seems to be kind of a common theme, and this device has lots of bits of broken plastic. Although this is a, I don't understand the design of this at all. I don't know why this is, like, why is there a spring there? Because it seems like the only thing the spring does is hold that broken piece of plastic in place. I don't know why that wasn't just uh, a, like, uh, you know, why that wasn't just molded that way. Why does that piece of plastic have to be held there by spring force? I don't know. It's really weird, but. I used epoxy to get that back together and hopefully that should be strong enough because the only thing that's doing is pulling on a switch on the circuit board. And since I had that whole cassette deck mechanism out of the way, I'm going to just clean out these switches and the potentiometers with some contact cleaner. So someone in a prior video had actually uh, gave me some really good information about using contact cleaner and deoxid because I was under the impression that they were the same thing, but they're definitely not. So I'm using contact cleaner right now, which is, it's just a cleaner and it just dissolves into nothing. 
Now, deoxid, on the other hand, has some lubricating oils in it as well. So you definitely don't want to just spray it everywhere like you can with, uh, the, uh, with the contact cleaner, because that just dissolves to nothing. So I'm cleaning up any of the extra uh, deoxid, just because that oil can collect dust uh, if it's on other stuff. And this is that record switch. So that nub that we put back together, uh, this is what it interfaces with to, to pull, to basically tell the device that it's like recording mode. So flipping this back into place and got to make sure that uh, that fixed piece of plastic interfaces with the, the switch and make sure I don't pinch too many wires in the process of putting this back together. Now, it does feel like that record switch is still getting caught up on something. And yeah, of course, there's a there's a wire just there because what well, wouldn't there be? And we can see a, a, a piece of the old belt just sitting on the bottom of that circuit board that I don't know how it possibly could have gotten there but I only noticed that in the edit, which is really funny to me. But we can give it a test now. So hit play and it seems to be playing. Uh, I'll have to adjust the speed and stuff later. Fast forward, fast forward's just fine. Now reverse does not. All right, so I have this reverse uh, rewind function open up again. Uh, because it wasn't working. It wasn't working well enough. Uh, so if you recall, basically it had a wheel that had a spring. So when this slides back, it allows this wheel to pivot and push itself into this. And you can see there's this little moon shape with a little wheel sticking out. And this is um, like a ridged wheel that's connected to the, uh, like the left take up reel. So when you put in a reverse, It'll push it into this wheel, which will then rewind it. And it was working okay, except on some tapes, uh, especially when you got a bunch of tape on one side, it really struggled to rewind. It was just slipping on this. And the problem was that there wasn't enough spring tension pushing it on this way. And I kind of suspected that would be an issue because it just, it didn't seem like there was much pushing up against this. And I checked the service manual and it's definitely correct. And so I tried to put uh, the spring in the right way and that plastic just sheared off again. It's a tremendous amount of spring pressure that they want to have against that little nub of plastic. It's basically this size because this is the, this is the spring and they want these to be basically facing the same uh, or the opposite direction. So right now they're both facing that way. You, they wanted you to bend this 180 degrees essentially. And that is so much force to put against that little nub, but it obviously needs it. Otherwise it won't rewind fast enough. And I had to get creative with how I was going to reinforce that broken piece of plastic because I had originally just glued and then melted it together. And that, I mean, that's fine as long as you're not putting a huge amount of force on it, and this was. And so I dare say this may be my finest work yet, but I have, <laughs> I, ha I had this solid core wire that I drilled a few holes through this, threaded around and just wrapped this thing in copper wire, melted the copper wire into the plastic, and then just covered all of it in epoxy. And hopefully that is enough to support this. I, I, it honestly might not be. Uh, and if it's not, then I guess I'll just put it in the way I had it and just live with the fact that it doesn't rewind well, but <laughs> I, I'll, we'll see if it, if it holds. It's, yeah, it's a tremendous amount of spring pressure that they expect to be on this little nub of plastic. And it's no shock that this thing ended up breaking. All right. So I don't think I did a very good job of explaining what's exactly happening with this rewind thing. So I'm just going to reiterate it here. So when you press in the rewind button, that little metal tab gets pushed forward. And now because of this giant spring here, it's pushing this whole thing constantly to the left. And so when that metal tab moves out of the way, that nub is able to move and then it pushes the wheel into the spindle. So that little nub is constantly under spring force. Uh, because it's always at the ready to just move to the left and push it into the, the take-up reel. So it's, it, it, that is so much force, especially with that giant spring there. So that's why it's broken. That's, that's like what's going on here.
well, hopefully at least one of those explanations made sense. Uh, and you can really see, you know, kind of how it works right there. But anyways, it does work now. Uh, and as of right now, it, it's still working. Uh, that that uh, plastic hasn't broke yet, so that's nice. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the view meter now. So it, it's getting stuck. So that's the microphone I'm tapping on right now. And it's, you know, it put voltage on the view meter and it can move, but it just doesn't fall back. So I'm just going to cut it out just to make it easier to work with and record this. Uh, and I'll just solder those back um, when this is all fixed. So we can see that there's this little screw on the back. And so you can just loosen that. And when you loosen it, it should hopefully have the view meter kind of fall back uh, to where it is. And I, I will need to adjust it so that it, it gets back to zero. And I do do that. But yeah, so here we can see hitting the battery um, check button works and it's now moving it's it's balancing so it's working correctly it's maybe it's not for perfectly calibrated uh, anymore but it's it is still moving at least which is fine uh, so let's get these uh, belts replaced for the tape counters as well so I mean luckily they weren't goo um, but yeah I'll just get the new some new belts in there and I do eventually put it on the right uh, spindle there <laughs> so ignore that for now so I wanted to just show how this automatic stop function works on this so it's like any other cassette mechanism where you hit play if it's um, basically runs out of tape so this stops spinning it'll be able to automatically turn off there it goes super interesting way that they're doing this so I've never seen this in any other thing so if I zoom in on this so this is that right take up reel. We have this arm and then we have this slip clutch here. So when I hit play, you can see that this clutch is just slipping underneath because it's tied to this. So as soon as I, this stops moving, that disc will stop rotating. And what's happening every time is there's this nub that you can just see right there. So every time it comes around, it pushes on this piece of plastic and this is all linked together and this will just push this back so it pushes it against the clutch and it just resets its position now it is also simultaneously tied to this white piece of plastic and you can see there's like a matching nub right there but every time this rotates because it's getting pushed out of the way by this nub it's dodging that nub and it's instead hitting this one now this is directly linked to the stop on the piano keys. So as soon as this gets plunged, uh, it'll stop and it turns it off. And so what happens when I hold this is that this nub will stop spinning, which will cause this to stop turning back and it will cause this to catch on it, which will then push this all the way and stop it. It's really bizarre. So. You can see it pushed it out of the way. It wasn't able to reset. And this time, it catches, turns it off. Wild. It seems so complicated of a way to do this. I, I can't even conceive of how you would come up with this system. It is... I've just never seen anything quite like this. And I'll show it again. So, rotating around. This little slip clutch has enough to push it out of the way. As soon as this stops stopping it from getting pushed out. So, right there... It pulled it out a little bit, and then on the next rotation, it'll pull it out fully. And once more. So that stops spinning, catches it, pushes this, which then cuts power. And it's the same as uh, uh, just pushing the stop button. It's just, yeah. <laughs> really wild mechanism. Pretty cool, though. I honestly kind of feel like I'm losing my mind rewatching this. I think I've said the word nub 15 times now in this video alone, and it's making me second guess myself. It's like, God, I hope I don't say it that many times in reality. I, I guess it's just the perfect word to describe this device is it's a bunch of nubs. <laughs> so but right now I'm uh, taking out the spindles just so I can get them cleaned up, get some new lubricant on them. So I have to get that arm thing out of the way uh, and then I can pull up this right one um, so I don't 
have a great way to really uh, clean those, but I'll just end up s blasting some of that contact cleaner through them. There is a bit of dirt on the actual spindles themselves. I don't know what's in those gears. I tried to clean them, but I really couldn't get good access to them. And here you can see I'm just spraying some contact cleaner through it. I use contact cleaner like it's a degreaser because it works pretty well for that uh, as well. And I, it's just, yeah, this main kind of mechanism is just filthy. So I'm doing my best just to give it a, a you know, a decent cleaning. I'm not going to get it perfect. Uh, I'm not going to get it perfect at all, but just to wipe down um, as best as I can. Uh, and we can see the head's actually in fine condition. Although on this race head, I noticed that the chassis, like this plastic housing is all cracked up for it. I mean, it seems sturdy enough, but that's, yeah, that's it's just a lot of broken plastic on this thing. So that's me putting a little, just a little dab of oil on the spindle, and it spins really nicely now. And doing the same for that one. Might have put too much on it right there, but that shouldn't be too big a deal. And don't worry, I do take that little weird string off the spring. I don't even know what that is. So get the arm back in place, get the E-clip back on. The E-clips are, uh, they haven't been, really been fighting me much this uh, on this device, which is that's a, kind of a nice, nice thing. I didn't lose any of them, didn't stab myself trying to take them off. And for now I'm gonna start looking at the speaker, try to clean it up, clean up this housing. You can see it's really dirty. I don't even, that almost looks like it's disintegrated foam, but I don't know where that foam could have came from. And the speaker itself seems to be in pretty good condition. It's still fairly flexible. So I'm just trying to wipe it down with a, a dry cloth here. So I'm, I'm not gonna try it too hard, just, just a very light uh, cleaning. It doesn't need to be perfect. Uh, now for this plastic housing on the other hand, I'm just gonna hose this down. <laughs> it's, it seems like the easiest way to, to clean this thing. Because it, I mean, it was just covered in that uh, that dust right there, and it seemed to work actually really well. Um, I wasn't sure how else I would get the dust out of the that grill there. So since I'm in the, the cleaning uh, mood right now, it seems I might as well clean the front panel as well. This this whole device it really hasn't been that dirty. The inside actually was was dirtier than the outside, but a uh, nice little clean to shine it up. It 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 still looks fine. It's pretty well worn, uh, lots of little nicks and stuff in it. But other than that, it should be fine. Yeah, it's a beautiful shot of that destroyed wire. So I'm just gonna desolder these from the speaker and just put new ones on. So you can see on that left one, I put I put some extra flux on it just to, just to help it because this is some pretty old solder. Now, unfortunately I did not have a brown wire, so had to use a, a yellow one and then I just uh, reattached it to those wires I had previously cut. And so now we can give it an actual test with the uh, the speakers and everything. So yeah, it works actually really well, uh, and it sounds pretty good too. That that little speaker sounds really decent. So let's get this front panel back on, start putting this back together. And so for that broken switch, I ended up printing a replacement. Uh, it's it's definitely not a it's not perfect, but it uh, it looks pretty good. And it there's thankfully enough plastic left on the switch that I can just I can still press it onto it, and it can still hold on pretty well. So I was I was pretty happy with that. So I'll get the rest of the knobs put back onto it. And we can put the uh, top back on as well. So I need to be very cognizant of where I'm putting those speaker wires so I don't just, you know, jam a screw through them like the last guy did. And, you know, any other number of wires that could be in the way. So got that. Uh, shielding ground wire thing soldered back onto the board 
and got those long screws plugged back in. And it never fails. I forgot to put the felt behind the switches, so I need to take it all apart again and do that again. Well, 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 it seems to be working. Uh, so let's change that. I want to modify this. I want to make this uh, rechargeable with USB-C because that's the new fad. Everything needs to be USB-C rechargeable and I'm all for it. So currently it runs on four D cell batteries. I'm going to see if I can use that battery compartment to put a bunch of stuff in it to make it so I can just plug this in and charge it up. Uh, I've never done anything like that. I have no idea how to do that. Uh, this should be interesting. I don't, I don't think it's going to be too hard, but I have been wrong once or twice before. And then I want to see if I can get some lighting around the view meters, J just some LED stuff. I I'm guessing back in when this was first designed, they didn't want to do that because it would, would have had to have been an incandescent bulb, which is probably not smart to run on D cell batteries. But yeah, I don't know. Be curious to see. Uh, be curious to see what I come up with. So let's get to it. So the way I'm going to get the lighting to work with this thing is I'm going to find some power from one of these wires or connections already inside the machine and just tap off of that. Now I want to find something that only gets power when it's getting played. So when you hit the play button, there's lots of little leaf switches in this device that gets tripped. So we can see this one on the left. When you hit play, it bridges the connection. Now when I did I tested that, there wasn't like hardly any voltage going across it. Now this pink one was perfect. So you can see those leaf springs get triggered when you hit play. And on those pink wires, there's six volts across it. And you're gonna see that demonstrated here. Uh, so I'm just gonna take those six volts and use that to power my LEDs. Uh, and so I'm just stealing power from there. So, so there's no power when it's not being played. And then there's six volts when I hit play, which is absolutely perfect. So I was kind of thinking about how in depth I should actually get about what I'm thinking here. Uh, but then I realized you're already this far into the video. I'm not sure if anything else I could do could actually scare you off. So I'm going to get really in depth as to like how I'm approaching this and my thoughts and like why I'm doing what I'm doing. So, starting from the top, batteries. So we're using these uh, 18650 cells. These are like the most uh, generic rechargeable lithium cells. Um, I do appreciate the name of these cheap eBay uh, batteries. I mean, come on, that's, that's pretty funny. <laughs> so these batteries are 3.7 volts. And the milliamp hours, um, you can calculate out the capacity of them. Uh, to, needless to say, 4D cell batteries has significantly more uh, capacity than just two of these, but I mean, I don't, it doesn't really matter because I could just recharge these. So anyways, these are 3.7 volts. Now the whole device runs on six volts. So what we can do is we can take two of these batteries and we can put them in series. Now what that'll do, it'll double the voltage. You'll just add the voltages of these two up, so we'll end up with 7.4 volts, which is above what we need, but we can, we can fix that. If you instead put batteries in parallel, the voltages stay the same, but now you can combine the milliamp hours. So now the capacity is doubled. So now that we have 7.4 volts coming out of this, we need something that can actually charge these batteries because you don't want to just directly hook them up to power because they'll just keep taking charge and charge. Uh, they can discharge too much as well, uh, especially when you have them in series, one can charge more than the other and that's really bad for the health of the batteries. So you can buy these little battery controllers. So this will have an input for each battery. So it'll have a power output and then it has a little sense line that you would put between the batteries. Uh, so uh, between the two series batteries and the, where they're connected, you put this sense line so it can detect if one's getting more charge than the other. And so you can just buy these uh, on, you know, wherever. So we have that done. So now we have 
our battery thing kind of figured out. So we're, we're getting power out, so the power out we're getting 7.4 volts. Now the USB-C is just hooked up directly to this because on this board the power out acts the same as the power in. I'm not actually sure how that works or if this will work at all. Uh, I guess we'll see. Now we're, we have the 7.4 volts coming out, so we need 6 volts. So you can use something called a buck converter. So a buck converter will take in voltage, it'll take in power, and it'll decrease the voltage by and increase the current. Uh, so that's what this is doing. So we're inputting 7.4, we can adjust this little screw, and then we'll eventually get 6 volts out. Now the current stuff we really don't care about, I mean more current's better I suppose, but this isn't drawing any amount of, like it's not drawing that much current that we should run into any limits here. We just want to get the correct voltage so that all the speeds are the same, I believe. So we have this address now. So now we have six volts out. We can just hook that directly to where those batteries used to hook up with in the battery compartment. Because I think this whole thing can live in the battery compartment. Now we need to address the lighting. Now the lighting, as we saw earlier, can just be bridged via a switch inside the, or can be used, we can use a switch inside the cassette deck uh, in order to pull out six volts from the device. Now, we don't need 6 volts, we need more than that because the LEDs won't even glow at 6 volts. They need a little bit more than that. And I think about 9 volts should be good. We can, you can figure that out just by messing around with it. Now we can use a boost converter to boost voltage, by, but it'll decrease current. Again, that doesn't really matter. These lights draw very little current, so it's no biggie. So that's the plan uh, for how I'm going to do this. Now, it's probably insane uh, to people who actually know electronics, but I don't. I know Legos, and so that's what I'm doing. I'm just using these pre-assembled things. I'm sure someone could just, you know, build a board that does all of this, but I can't. So this is what I'm going to do. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It, uh, it should be interesting. I, I, I don't even know if this is going to work, but we'll see. Well, to start, I'm going to get the power out and in wires soldered onto this battery management board. So I didn't have any black or red wires, so I'm using blue and white. Uh, and here's this plastic housing that's actually going to hold those 18650s. Uh, so I'm just going to super glue, or not super glue, hot glue that uh, battery management board just directly to the side of it. So you can see that red wire, so that's what's actually putting these batteries in series. So it's just connecting the positive of one directly to the negative of the next. Now this yellow wire is directly connected to those two as well. So it's right in the middle of the series and it's going to the BM spot on this board, which is the battery management side. Uh, so that's gonna make sure that they're staying balanced. And then the B minus B plus, that's just the battery plus and the battery minus on the other side. Now, to make sure this can all fit, I'm going to remove this, the old springs that were originally in this. So they're just glued down, so I just need to pull them up. Now, that wire I just cut, that is what connected these batteries in series, because it used to be 4D cells, that's how you get 6 volts. So we don't care about that brown wire, but that black wire, that black wire is the negative, and that uh, brown wire over there is the positive. So those two are what we're interested in. So I have those directly connected to the output of that buck converter. And then I have the battery pack connected to the input of it. So we're, that's where we're inputting the 7.4 volts. And we're going to use that buck converter to get it down to 6 volts. And then that 6 volts is just directly connected to the device itself. Now we also have those two wires on that input for the buck converter because that's tied to the battery input as well. And that's where we're going to attach the USB-C input. And so you can see those two wires on the other underneath of that board. So I'm just going to hot glue it down here. And now I debated where to put 
that USB-C input, but I think the best spot is just in this battery department. So I filed, drilled and filed a slot that should perfectly fit that USB-C. Uh, and so that USB-C breakout board, you can see it has lots of little pins, but we're only interested in two of them. We want the ground and then we want the V the V bus, so the, the voltage, so the five volts out. So that's where the white's going. So that V bus connection, that's giving us the five volts out of any of those power supplies that connect via USB-C. And then that blue wire's the ground. And so that's just connected directly to that input. Okay, so here's what I'm thinking as to actually get this thing lit. There's really not that much room around this to stick it to. So I'm thinking I'm going to try to stick this strip to the top of the front panel, something like that, and try to make a detachable wire so this can just get pulled off and it's not like you know a bunch of wires. Because I can, I can still stuff quite a few wires in this area, uh, you know, like what the designers did in the first place. So I think that's, I think that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to start by uh, soldering some wires onto that little strip and then using that adhesive backing to stick it right above where the VU meter is and a little bit of hot glue to reinforce those, uh, that wire. So I'm just pulling those wires through a little hole that's already there, so that's super convenient. And the front panel seems to close just fine with that in the way. Now I need to find a ground to attach that LED to. So the LED negative will need to go to ground somewhere on the device because I'm just using the battery negative as like the common ground. So luckily this little pin, that middle one is directly connected to ground. So I can just solder right to it. There's nothing else even attached to it. So it's just, it's perfect right there. So I just took it out, soldered to it, and now I can put it back in place. And that's the ground situated. So now on that pink wire, that's where we were getting our six volts when it's turned on. So I'm gonna pull those six volts out and I'm just gonna thread that into the battery pack because that's where we're gonna have that boost converter to get the six volts up to the nine volts. And so that's it installed right there. So I have the white wire from the LED going to that and then I have the red wire as well. Well, the grounds for that uh, boost converter are just uh, the same. So they're just directly tied to each other. So you can see that green wire. It's just tied to another ground point. So put those batteries in it and take your bets. Do you think this will actually work? Well, at the very least, the lid still fits. I've actually realized something. Uh, I've overlooked a part of this. And it's that this little USB-C board is only going to provide five volts out and this little board wants to see 7.4 volts because it's trying to charge the batteries up to 7.4 because I was getting weird stuff happening with this um, it would just like stop working for no reason at all and I think it's because this wasn't detecting like charging current or something and we must be like cutting like if the voltage is too low to charge it because it was only getting five volts it must automatically cut it out uh, and it just, I think it waits until it gets a high enough voltage again to, to start up, the, to, to start the whole thing up again. So <laughs> I got to get this five volts up to, uh, 7.4. So that means, uh, yeah, we got to put another, <laughs> uh, DC to DC boost converter in this. This is, I mean, this is getting ludicrous at this point. There's no reason I need to have three of these for this project. This has to be the most convoluted way of going about this, but I luckily have just just enough room right there to put it. So I, hopefully that'll fix our problem. And I cannot wait to hear the comments on this video and just like it just how much better I could have done this. <laughs> And luckily, adding in this little boost converter is a very easy thing to do. So I'm just going to hot glue it to that far left wall where those springs used to be. So that old input is now plugged into the output of that boost converter. And then that USB-C is just directly plugged into the input of that. So you can see right now it's outputting 9 volts. So if I adjust that little blue potentiometer, it'll change the voltage. So I got it down to 7.39 and I overshot it a bit. It's really sensitive, that tiny little screw. So here, I overshot it again and just tuning it right down to 7.4-ish. And so here we can see that when it's not plugged in, there's that light glowing on the buck converter, which it wasn't doing before, so that's perfect. And 
honestly, that's probably just another way that battery's going to drain, because I think that light will always be on. But <laughs> I, it does work, at least. And the lid still goes on. And here we can really see it with the light. I think that looks great. But that should be all. So, as always, I, uh, I thank you for watching, especially this long one, and uh, have a nice day. All right, well, it's all done. It's, uh, it actually turned out super well. I'm very happy with this. The view meter lights up really nicely. It's almost oh, too bright. I might t turn it down a bit, but yeah, the battery works, the charging thing works. Um, the battery capacity, it's definitely gonna be less than what it was. Uh, 4D cell batteries, that's a, that's a lot of capacity. And just those two lithium cells, it's, it, it's probably not gonna be great. And even with, especially with the three DC to DC converters in there, you're getting some efficiency losses. But it should be, I don't know, it should be fine enough. We'll see if I'll get through this recording. And even if it's not, it's got the, the USB-C on the back that I can just plug in. Uh, I would say the only thing that doesn't work super great is the rewind. Um, and we saw the fix for that, so it's... It's no wonder that that happens. The it does rewind. It's just a little stutter stoppy, um, but yeah, it, it does work. I haven't. It hasn't broken yet. I can definitely foresee that breaking at some time in the future. But yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed, and I'll leave you with some uh, some music I recorded with this. Well, I would do that, but I'm pretty sure I recorded over the music I recorded with this talking part. So we're just gonna read this a pre-recorded tape I've made. <laughs>